Now, how many of you have a target buck out there that you're after for this fall? We have several, and uh, we have some that really stick out. And I want to talk to you about how you can have a good plan for the entire season uh, to actually harvest your, your target buck. Over the years, let's go back uh, 25 years, I find that I shoot about 80% of my target bucks. So we're on those bucks, and it's not a needle in a haystack. And a lot of times before the season begins, I can pick out two or three stand locations and say this is probably where we're going to shoot Junior or Ocho or L.L. Beans or Newbie. You have bucks that you've known in the past. I want to talk about three stand locations that are great for shooting your target buck and how you plan on it. But I want to back up a little bit. A lot of these bucks only give you a few pictures. Some of those bucks, I call them non-core bucks, are bucks that are coming from a great distance to your land. They only show up around the rut and then they're gone. Those are non-core bucks. Core bucks are in and around your land all the time. And it might be they're gone for two or three weeks and they come back, but they're two different bucks. That core buck, I can hunt them when bow season opener begins all the way through the end of the season, potentially. Where that core buck, I'm non-core buck, I'm just looking in that middle portion of the season during the rut. So you really have to determine what kind of buck you're after and when the timing is on your property. A lot of those non-core bucks have been able to shoot because he's told me for three years, hey, I like your property, but I don't like it that much. I like wherever I'm coming from a lot more, and usually that's a mile, mile and a half away. But I'm gonna come on your property during the rut, and I'm not gonna come over when the winds are really high, I'm not gonna come over when it's super hot, and I'm not gonna come over right at the beginning of the rut because I already have does next to me that are easy pickings. But towards the middle of the rut and end of the rut, it's gonna be a lot harder to get bucks or get does. And so what that buck has been telling you is that I'm gonna show up in about a 10 day window, I'm only gonna come when the weather's good, and then you choose one of these three stand locations I'm gonna talk about, and you got them. Sounds easy, right? Well, let's go through these stand locations. Maybe it's not, because the first one, right now we have one of our target bucks, one of my main target bucks right now is Junior. And Junior has been hanging around this part, these parts right here for three years. We call him Junior because he was a lot like Bo. So Bo is a buck, a six-year-old I shot last year. Junior is a five-year-old this year. I passed him up a couple times last year. Junior exhibit some of the same patterns as Bo, although I think he's slanted towards this area a little bit more and Bo goes over the hill and over into the middle portion of our property a little bit and that's where I ended up shooting him. Junior is around this location during the summertime. We don't see him every day. I'm not even sure we can say we see him every week, but we see him enough to know what locations he might be for that opening day window. That opening day window is a very short window. So we have a great redneck blind right behind me, tucked back in the brush, and we can shoot this beautiful clover plot. This opportunity is fleeting because along with this summer location, this summer pattern location, we have to understand that the alfalfa soybeans that he's hitting out in the distance over this way are gonna be gone not too far into the season. That means wherever he's living, right over there, that big hardwoods, there's a big stand of hardwoods behind me up on the hill. It's all open timber. Bucks love to lay in there during the summer. They're surrounded by hay on two sides. Alfalfa, it's green, it's beautiful. And then get into those locations and it's prime shade. We have a breeze right now. There's usually a breeze because we're on top of the ridge. They're out of bugs, they're out of the thick stuff. They're smashing their velvet through. And that window is really fleeting because all that changes. You get the last cutting of hay, it frosts out, the beans are picked, and all of a sudden they shift patterns. So I need to know where, maybe I shoot them right here for an opening day window, which is very small. Where's he gonna go to next? Well, he goes towards food. And so he wants to find his fall food source and it's next to his fall cover and he wants to hang out. And that fall food source is my next opportunity to kill him. So it could be that it's end of September, early October, middle of October, sometime before the rut, where he's already back in his bedding area around daylight. It's hard to get in there and hunt him. You don't know exactly where he's at. You know he's in an area, a five or 10 acre area, maybe even know that. Although I might have an opportunity at that buck later in that bedding area, I'm really focusing on the food. So I'm looking at food end of September, early to mid-October, and a lot of people say, well, there's that October lull. Not when you have good, dedicated green food sources, or food sources of the moment, apple trees, maybe a white oak drop in acorns, and you recognize that, 
and I'm looking for food sources that are remote. So I'm looking for small hunting plots. I'm looking for apple trees. I'm looking for a little grove of white oak acorns early, red oaks later. And so that's that food source location. So you have the early season, which is really fleeting. And then you have that food source location. And as long as that food source is there and consistent, something small though, oh, just a pass through on the way to something else. Maybe you have a grove of white oaks here and acorns and you just slide over to those red oak acorns. But I need to determine where he's moving to in the fall. A lot of times it's a mile, mile on average. So in this window right here, I can honestly say that although Junior's range is probably somewhere over here, he shifts over at least a half mile, quarter mile into where his fall range is. It's kind of nice here because we can actually have fall dedicated crops just 300 yards that way or 100 yards that way. We have fall cover there and then on the neighbors we have summer crops so those box can shift if they want to call this home for a longer period of time they can do that but they're still shifting so when they shift i want to find that early to mid season food source and that might even be around in late season if it's still that window movement moving through especially if you have that small honey hole food plot and i guess there's a deer right behind me oh yeah, this is one of those remote spots. <laughs> I told Dylan one of the bad things is we get in here with the Polaris Kinetic, it's the battery operated. They don't hear us coming, so we see a lot more game. That's not necessarily a good thing. Hey there. Apparently they're not like my dog. <laughs> they don't come on over, but I tried. But uh, pretty cool, and that's we sneak into these locations and they really are bedded close in here. We come in with uh, kinetic, they don't hear us coming. So it's a lot different. We actually hear roosters when we're going around, we hear Tom. So it's pretty uh, pretty nice having that quiet ride. But regardless of that, we're getting into that afternoon, e evening feeding time. And that really supplies that target buck location, but I want it remote. I don't want my stand in the middle of it. You see this redneck right here. We actually walk through a bank of switchgrass and a tunnel through the briars and then full switchgrass on the other side. So we can literally sneak in and out of that blind. It's not too hard to imagine. We can get in and out without spooking deer that are out here. We had this one walk in on us while we're talking out here and let alone getting into here while one's feeding and they can't see you. Just gotta be quiet getting in and out. And uh, I think that's one of the really underestimated aspects of deer hunting is just being quiet. You can be loud and ruin your hunt before it even begins. So we have that fleeting early season time. Then we have that food source time that you're hunting afternoon, evening. You're not getting in there morning because you're gonna spook it out. That's part of the discipline of hunting. This is an afternoon food source. We're not getting here in the morning and spooking it out. Hey guys, just a second, we'll be right back. But First Light has an incredible launch. They're phase, core, and thermic outer gear. Lightweight, medium, heavy. I mix and match all of them. First Light's evolved over the last five years that I've used it, going from windproofing to all this great stuff. Even their lightweight stuff has fleece now. It's all super quiet, fits incredible, and I feel privileged to use it. Please check it out. July 30th, this is a giant launch, the biggest I've seen since I've been with First Light. So check it out, go look at the site, and now we'll go back to the video. And then finally, we have that early morning, morning access stand location. For Junior, we have a food source over on the bottom, 67 we call it, it's a beautiful clover field. It's about 400, 500 yards from here. That's where we see him a lot more during the hunting season. And then above that, it's actually on the ne next ridge over. Again, where his core area shifts during the fall. We have a really nice water hole location where we can access through open timber up the backside, get into that water hole on a ridge point and wait for the deer to come back to us for a couple hundred yards off the food source. I've passed up Junior on that food source. I've passed up Junior on the food source about 500 yards that way. So again, that's his core area, but I've identified the early season small window, that afternoon, evening food source stand that I can hunt for a long period of time, and then that morning rut stand. And that morning rut stand, I wanna have enough cover between me and an adjacent large food source where does and fawns are bedded in front of me and not at that point where I'm coming at because those does and fawns are gonna repel that buck even during the rut. He doesn't wanna bed up there with him. He might chase him, he might move through him. But when he's bedding by himself back in the cover and he wants to relax, he's gonna bed away from those does and fawns. And I wanna be in that window that could be anywhere from two to 400 yards away from that food source if there's good cover. If there's open timber, then it's probably a summer hangout location. 
that's an area he doesn't want to be anyways, and neither do the deer. So the rest of the deer herd, they want to be in thick cover next to that food source, especially those does and fawns. And then when you come in in the morning time, you're not walking through the food, you're coming in from the opposite or at least well around that food source. You're getting into that bedding area stand and you're waiting for those deer to come back to you. So those three stand locations, may I gotta identify what buck it is, he might have only given you a few pictures. He tells you he's a non-core buck. You hunt him during the rut in your morning stand and you got him. But think about the short window stand, the all season afternoon feeding stand, but especially early to mid-October. You can hunt that during the rut too. Not a bad spot, but you have to add that morning stand to your arsenal. It's interesting because I probably hunt morning stands only about 20% at the most of all my sits that they account for about 70% of all my bucks. So very important stand to get into your arsenal. You have to walk around food. You can't sit on food. You can't spook the deer off food in the morning. Come in from the backside into the bedding area and wait for those deer to come back. You will be right in that wheelhouse for those target bucks. In between the morning stand and especially that, that late September, to mid-October afternoon food source stand that carries through the season, then you have a great hunt. And it looks like she's coming back. I wonder if she's got a fawn around here. And, um, or maybe she just likes us, I don't know. <laughs> she's not even taking off too fast, so. No, we don't have pet deer out here. We really don't, these are in the wild. But uh, follow those three strategies so that you can be on track for your target box this fall. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching the video. I appreciate you watching the videos. We have over 600 articles on whitetailhabitatsolution.com. It's all free. And I also appreciate those of you that check out our books. I have five books starting from 2012. We have web classes on the site, whitetailhabitatsolutions.com. Check out Pure Wildlife Blends. I really appreciate you guys that have already purchased our seed. We've had thousands of people. We've shipped to 48 states. We have digital land management through whitetailstrategy.com. That's taking all these ideas and concepts I put in the YouTube videos and digitally transforming your land for you. And then finally, we have our clients and client visits. We'll visit over 300 clients as a group this year. We visit anywhere in the country. Boots on the ground is always the best, but we have a lot of ways to help you from free to client visits and all in between. Check us out again, whitetailhabitatsolutions.com, Pure Wildlife Plans, and whitetailstrategy.com.